Our next guest says that lawmakers and not the central bank have the best tools to soften the economic blow from the coronavirus. Joining us now on the phone is Pavlina Chernov. Cherneva, there we go. She's an associate professor and director of the economics program at Bard College. She's also a scholar at the Levy Economics Institute and author of the forthcoming book, The Case for a Job Guarantee. Uh, professor, it's great to speak with you. Um, I, I want to get your thoughts first on what the president just announced. Uh, as we were saying around the desk, he seems to have changed his tone a little bit here in talking about the kinds of support that the government would be ready to provide, whether it's to individuals expanding the sick leave, paid sick leave, or we're offering support to uh, industries that are directly affected, like the airline industry. Are those the kinds of steps that get us in the right direction to uh, being able to support uh, those who are hurt the most by this virus? Yes. I, we. The sooner we realize how serious the economic repercussions will be, the better. I think that we're definitely moving in the right direction finally. But we've got to start thinking bigger and bolder. Because um, I, I, have, I feel that the domino effects are going to be much more extensive than we are um, realizing at this moment. I think we should expect an avalanche of layoffs uh, that will bring more bankruptcies, more defaults. Uh, the profits will remain depressed for a very long time. And so we, as we think about the current moment, we got to think both in terms of what we need to do now and what we need to do tomorrow uh, in terms of direct measures. Okay, let's talk about those. What do we do right this second on a direct basis in terms of getting money out into the economy via fiscal channels so that we don't go into a depression, a recession or a depression? I'm not sure that we can avoid a very serious recession, in part because that is a requirement for what we need to do to contain this virus. We literally have to stop a lot of economic activity right now, immediately. So instead of thinking about sort of nudges or incentives, uh, we have to think about exactly direct intervention. So the, the most immediate things that people will be concerned about is whether they can have um, free medical care, whether they can have paid leave, I think checks in the mail are perfectly sensible as uh, emergency measures right now, extended unemployment insurance, but that's not enough. We gotta think about, about this problem almost as, as a war, the way we mobilize during a war and after uh, the war. So if today we need to um, resource our medical uh, sector, with uh, supplies, resources, medical equipment, etc., we need to figure out a very uh, direct plan to mobilize, to put in place the logistical support, all of the other equipment and human resource support that needs to be put in place to handle uh, a potentially an overwhelmed uh, health care system. All right, so as we trans. Yeah. So, Pavlina, I mean, when you look at sort of where we are right now, the idea that there could be a relatively long duration to this crisis, when you start to think about the solutions here, what you're talking about are large structural changes to the way uh, we sort of structure our economy and the, really the way we run our government. Uh, there's a lot of spending there. Do you think that this is enough of a shock, this coronavirus health scare, that this is enough of a shock where we could actually see those sort of structural changes? I certainly hope so. I mean, there are many lessons that we're learning from this crisis. The first one is that we absolutely need a fully resourced public sector in all aspects of, of our public life, whether it is adequately stocking the national strategic stockpile, whether it is having an adequate health care system, health insurance system. There are many lessons uh, to learn. I think one of them, a big one, is that, first of all, the public sector not only has an important role to play, but it must have strong, robust safety nets for all types of downturns, severe or softer ones. And the second one is that as we start thinking about the many casualties in the economy, uh, we need to figure out how to address uh, a failing airline industry or a restaurant industry that is losing 80 percent in their demand, uh, auto manufacturers that are not selling cars retailers. So we can start thinking in terms of patchwork of policies to provide stimulus. But the, to me, one of the most important ones we have to be thinking about is direct uh, public investment and direct employment. Mm -hmm. uh, just whether that includes 
uh, infrastructure investment, whether it is some sort of Green New Deal, whether it includes a jobs guarantee, a person who has a stable and solid paycheck can buy that airplane ticket, can go to the restaurant, can pay the mortgage bill. And so this has to be part of the package to right. create a trickle-up bailout. How do we pay for all this, Professor? Well, financing is not the, the problem. I think that this crisis very clearly demonstrates this. Whenever we need to mobilize our resources, the government simply votes in policies into existence. And as, we, as, as you can see, we're not scratching our heads right now about do we have the money to pay for all of these measures, fiscal measures. The, the government is self-financed. We have institutions that we have designed for this reason alone to ensure that all payments are made by the public sector. So uh, the way we paid for all of these large-scale infrastructure investments during war or after World War II, the way we paid for the New Deal, this is how we will be paying for any measure that we uh, implement now, or else we will be paying still for the damage. I want to talk about a sort of specific specific thing. You're talking about uh, the need for a bottom-up response and uh, getting money into the hands of people. Unfortunately, due to the nature of this particular crisis, even if people get the money they need to feed their families, to pay their bills, to address their medical costs, there are certain class of businesses that they are being specifically told to avoid for the sake of public health. Almost anything related to bars, restaurants, ground level retail, anything where multiple people congregate at once, they're told not to uh, use these for a while. And of course, these are businesses that tend to uh, run on very thin margins. How would you think about constructing a public response for the businesses who, uh, whose very existence and activity temporarily is a threat to defeating the virus? That's right. I mean, my uh, my response will begin with the workers first and providing the protections. But clearly, we still have business owners that have to pay mortgages and they have loans. And so assistance with refinancing and uh, any possible moratorium on payments where possible. We, we do this with student loans. Uh, we can think of creative ways of doing this on uh, various mortgage payments. But um, as you're quite right, sending people a check right now will primarily help with paying down mandatory bills. Uh, but we should not be encouraging uh, increased economic activity until uh, we we are prepared to sort of resume. But the uh, normal economic activity. But that's really the trick. You know, the trick is how do we return to normalcy? And I think that uh, if this is uncharted territory, and the way we return to normalcy is to put a larger responsibility for the public sector to undertake all manner of investment, direct investment, in areas that have been long neglected so that we can truly trickle up the stimulus throughout the economy and it trickles through all of those businesses and industries that are losing, um, that are losing sales and profits right now. All right, Professor, great to get your thoughts. That's Pavlina Cherneva, Associate Professor of Economics over at Bard College, and of course, she's a research scholar at the Levy Economics Institute.